Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, session of Coffee and Chat of Jeanette. Today we are holding an English-speaking session in order to receive our guests, and particularly uh, Guido Noto Ladiega. And I will first give my introductory remarks uh, to this session related to the role of algorithms in law and transparency and prejudice in information society. I would like first to give you uh, a very quick in overview of the topic. I think it's a very important thing to do when we are discussing a issue inside the, the research agenda of the project, which is Coffee and Chat of GNET, our group of international studies on internet, intellectual property and innovation in our law school, and also with the support of IRIS, Research Institute of Internet and Society, which I have the honor to be a member of the scientific Council, and I'm very glad to be here on behalf also of the University of Minas Gerais, holding this event. So thank you, Guido, for coming to <coughs> Belo I'm sure that we are uh, experiencing here a very unique opportunity. First, to have an international foreign guest in our university, and second, to promote a discussion about very interesting issue related to the limits of the use of algorithms in law and how the algorithms as a part of the engineer and computer engineer language is affecting our daily lives in this sense. So uh, perhaps it's the moment for all of us and the participants to engage in a very interdisciplinary debate involving law and technology, particularly in respect to different theoretical frameworks and practical implications surrounding machine learning, artificial intelligence, social media, social networking, cybersecurity, and cyber surveillance. Indeed, one should know that the increasing use of algorithms to accomplish complex tasks in the daily digital information economy, covering a range of areas like labor, communication, social interactions, and even the mer simple commercial activities also gives room for a further normative, political, social, and ethical debate in the legal domain. Apart from general claim, underlying efficiency, speed, interoperability between systems, computer, and networks, it appears to be necessary to revisit the inherent risks arising from the use of algorithms for the manipulation, bias, degradation, and even downgrading of standards, and at a more severe stage, the violation of rights, such as privacy, civil, political, social, economic rights, and cultural rights in connection with digital networks and the internet interactions. The role of law and governance in this field should be to proper tackle those issues at a social, legal, critical, and philosophical level. The challenges would be also seen in several fields, such as information theory itself. If we go, for instance, the debate on the relationship between information theory and law, we will understand how the discussion about internet algorithms is still a debate that is interest for law and the legal studies. The sign of noise, racial communication, for instance, the key to creating a better computerized legal search engine, as we are used to know, is to reduce the sign to noise ratio in the link between the user and the search engine. At this ratio decrease, it's possible to understand how, how legal research captures the uncompressed form of legal information into an algorithm for predicting what the law will be in a particular situation. The ongoing improvement of legal research transforming the optimal form of the law by changing the cost of finding is still a very challenging situation. 
The second topic, the relationship between the use and misuse of algorithms and the violation of human rights. Everybody here is quite familiarized with those issues related to cyber security and cyber surveillance. And this also occurs at the level of the corporate transactions, financial transactions, and even the more simple transactions and interactions taking place at the social network platforms, like Facebook, for instance. And so it's also a task for the legal field and also the lawyers to question those issues, looking to the main comprehensive international legal framework dealing with the protection of human rights. For instance, the interplay between international treaties such as the United Nations Conventions on Human Rights, Protection of Civil, Civil Political and Social, Economic and Cultural Rights, and the way how those conventions, which are adopted by several countries within the United Nations and ratified by countries like Brazil, have to be taken into consideration when it deals with the relationship between the use and misuse of algorithms <coughs> at the transnational level and how those corporations, governments, and generally known state actors also uh, use and misuse the algorithms in order to manipulate to bias, to degradate information in the way even how knowledge is constituted. Because it's important to see that knowledge is not the same thing as information. The information is just the part of being used to constitute and to form, to create knowledge. And finally, it's important to see the role of algorithms in the law, specifically in the law of internet. It's said that Algorithms are changing the way how law is applied, but also how law is understood, interpreted, and applied by the courts. It's quite interesting to see how the way how the computer machine, computer learning in artificial intelligence is changing the way how we perceive very, very, very simple issues and categories of law, such as property, contract and liability. And liability rules are very important in a very democratic society and also to the rule of law, especially in those cases where transactions and property, contracts in general, are not the only way to respond to the social demands and also to the social challenges in the society. Social transformation also depends upon clear, transparent, and very safe rules of liability. And liability is something that the computer language and computer engineering itself is not able to break and also not able to develop. So, in this sense, I believe that discussion and the debate regarding the algorithms in law is more than a debate about transparency but it's also a debate about the way how prejudice is also entering in the whole societal environment through the use of social media, social network platforms, and also the activism, even for the good or for the bad. So, thank you very much for this uh, initial uh, contact and also more than this, with the opportunity to, to be here opening this session of coffee and chat of Jeanette. I hope that everybody here is in, will enjoy the presentations. And I will just go for the uh, presentation uh, of the, uh, the both speakers today. Uh, as, as Pedro and Luisa told before, uh, Professor Marco Antonio Alves is, is a little bit delayed to this session, and I will greet the, the curriculum is very important for us to talk about the biography before and we start to speak in, in this session. Marco Antonio Alves is adjunct professor of theory and philosophy of law at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. He has a doctoral degree in philosophy by University of Minas Gerais and also was a exchange scholar in ASS Paris with the thesis uh, which was awarded with the UFMG award of thesis and also with the honor mentions by CAPES in 2015. 
Uh, Marco Antonio has master's degrees in philosophy, his bachelor of law in philosophy at the University of Minas Gerais, <coughs> and currently he's working in the study, study group on the information society in algorithm and governance, and the study group on philosophy, law, and power. Dr. Guido Noto Ladiega is lecturer in law at the Northumbria University, visiting professor at Stasio de Sá in Rio de Janeiro, president of ITAL IoT, Internet of Things, Center of Multidisciplinary Research of the Internet of Things, fellow of NEXA, Center of Internet Society, Cultore della Materia in Intellectual Property in Private Law at the University del Studio di Palermo, founder of DPA 2018, and qualified lawyer called to the bar in Italy in 2013, currently of Council of Damiani in Damiani International Law Firm, and his research is focused on cyber law, intellectual property, and sex law. So, thank you very much, Guido, for coming. Uh, I believe that since Professor Michael Antonio is out for some moments, some minutes, I would suggest that we proceed with the presentation of uh, Professor Guido in this sense, and hoping that everybody will be very engaged in this discussion today. Uh, thank you again uh, for coming, and I would like to expressly thank all the team from Jeanette and Iris for being a part of uh, this project, and more than that, very com committed to the success of these meetings, which for sure are very unique, very uh, exceptional in the environment of the University of Minas Gerais, not only because of the, the language which is spoken today, we could also try perhaps Italian or further languages, but also uh, to see how this um, project concerning the studies of internet law and internet governance at the global, um, the global outreach is a, a very important project that we are uh, holding at the University of Minas Gerais. So thank you, Guido, and I will excuse for everybody for um, leaving the room uh, before um, later because I have uh, another external conference today. It's a pity because I'm skipping this part. I'm not such kind of student, but uh, in fact I had this uh, this uh, compromise before. So Guido, thank you so much for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, can I can I stand or it's a problem for you? No. Okay. Because. Oh. Okay. So, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, thank you to Iris and Jeanette for organizing this, and the Faculty of Law of this university for hosting the event. Uh, for me, it's really a one in a lifetime opportunity to eat the best ponji queijo of Brazil. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here. Um, so today I would like to tell you a story. Um, on the 13th of June of last year, 2016, uh, a man, a guy of my age, uh, in, from Wisconsin, United States, uh, was driving uh, a car with the o without the owner's consent. At some point, he saw the police, and instead of stopping, he ran away. Uh, what do you think happened to this man? He was imprisoned for, he was sentenced to six years for simply this. And I don't know how is the law on criminal law on this kind of issues here in Brazil, but I think that six years for this kind of behavior is really a lot. So why that happened? Because of an algorithm, and that's what we are talking about today. An algorithm decided that this guy was a threat to the community. And so even though the offense was a minor offense, he got sentenced to six years, as if he was a real criminal, like a terrorist, okay? Um, and where is the problem in this? You may say, I mean, even a judge can make a mistake and the same mistake can be made by um, an algorithm. What's the difference? 
The difference is that uh, the algorithm used, the software used is called Compass and it's a proprietary software. This means that it's covered by trade secrets and as a consequence, Eric Loomis and his lawyers were not able to inspect the algorithm and understand why Eric was a threat to the community. So I think that we as lawyers uh, or students or citizens, we really have a duty to think about whether these kind of scenarios are fair or not, if they comply with basic human rights or not. Uh, so today I would like to answer three questions. We don't have a remote control, but we have this, so we'll do this and you change slides, <laughs> right? Great. Um, so we want to answer three questions. The first is, can algorithms replace us? Can, practically. Should they replace us? So if they can replace us, should they? Uh, and then what can we do about it? Okay? Can they? <laughs> can algorithms replace us or not? Uh, I think they can't. They cannot. Uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the, reasons I, the reason I chose here is related to the role of interpretation in the life of a lawyer. Uh, I don't know if you agree with this, but I think that everything we do as lawyers is interpretation. Every time that we read a document, we are not reading a document, we are interpreting a document. Every time a judge is applying the law, he's interpreting the law. So really everything we do is interpretation. So if an algorithm is going to replace uh, a human being, for instance, a human judge, we have to ask ourselves if an algorithm can interpret the law. What's legal interpretation? Is it a mechanic uh, operation where you have the facts, you have the law, and you combine them together? I think we all agree that it doesn't work like this, right? It's a way more complex operation where a lot of factors have to be assessed in order to interpret and apply the law. It's not a mechanical operation, and it's an operation where there is a lot of discretion. And when there is a lot of discretion, it's debatable that an algorithm can, be, can actually replace the human decisor because the algorithm can't cope that well with strong discretion. Um, I am sure that you speak very well Latin, right? Everyone here. So traditionally, uh, they say that, the Latin said that in claris non fit interpretatio. Okay, which means that there are easy cases where you don't need interpretation because they are easy. What Hart and other philosophers with whom I agree uh, claim is that actually you can't really distinguish between an easy case and a hard case because you can't distinguish it ex ante. You know after you interpret a case if a case is easy or hard. You don't know it beforehand. Um, and uh, this, of course, poses um, some issues if we want an algorithm to replace a human being. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Hmm? No. Hmm? <laughs> Come on, seriously? OK. Um, so this is about anal sex. Why am I talking about anal sex today? Um, this is called poppers, okay? Uh, it's a drug that's particularly mm, popular in England, but it's, you can find it everywhere. Um, it's, it helps relaxing the muscles, all the muscles. That's why it's particularly good if you want to have an enjoyable anal sex. Um, so why am I talking about this? I, I don't know. Ah, there must be a reason. So ah, yeah, um, I want to talk about how interpretation is changing and how it's becoming really, really discretionary. OK? Um, so last year, the UK passed a law that had the purpose of banning poppers. 
So this, this sort of drug that was used just to have anal sex, they said, no, we don't want people to have anal sex with this drug, so we want to ban it, okay? So there is a lot of debate. You can imagine all these lords and ladies in the House of Lords uh, discussing anal sex, and that's actually happened. Um, and they decided, no, we don't want this, so let's ban it, okay? Uh, so we have the intention of the legislator, which is clear. Let's ban poppers. The wording of the law, which is clear. Let's ban poppers. Do you think poppers are legal or illegal now? They are legal. They are still legal. So how is that possible? I mean, we have a clear law. We have a clear intention. What's the problem? The problem is that the name of the act is Psychoactive Substances Act. After the parliament passed the law, uh, a bunch of doctors wrote a letter saying, guys, we understand what you want to do, but poppers are not psychoactive. So we are sorry you wanted to ban them, but they are not psychoactive substances, so they fall out of the scope of the law. Okay? And this is just an example to show how complicated, really, is interpreting the law. Because even in a case as easy as this, the result is unexpected. So this was the first point. Can algorithms replace us? I think not, because interpretation is ubiquitous and because interpretation is discretionary. Uh, but let's say that I am wrong, OK? And let's say that actually they can replace uh, human judges. They can replace human decision makers, OK? The point now is that should they replace us or not? Uh, here we have just three uh, points. Um, Fabrizio, you, you are missing a lot. We were talking about anal sex. So, <laughs> uh, then, then you will explain him. <laughs> uh, here just I'm listing three reasons why I think algorithms shouldn't replace uh, human decisors. Uh, the first one is algorithmic bias or machine bias. Um, are you familiar with this concept? Yes? Some of you? Yeah? OK, so for instance, um, a, a case which is really interesting is the case of a colleague. She's from the MIT. So one, once she was crossing the border in the United States, she was with a bunch of colleagues. Everyone was passing, no problems at the border. It, was, it came her moment. She was standing in front of the machine, of the face facial recognition uh, software machine, and the machine couldn't see her. And she was like, how is that possible? Everybody, nobody had problems, and I am the only one struggling. And why do you think the machine couldn't see this woman? Hmm? The color of the skin. She was black. Okay? Uh, so the problem there was probably that uh, the algorithm used for the facial recognition had been trained on weight, uh, weight, white males, possibly. Okay? So she could, they couldn't recognize a, a black woman. Okay? So this is algorithmic bias. And that's one of the reasons why I think that maybe even if algorithms can replace us, I don't want them to replace us. I want a human being, I want to blame a human being for a thing like this, okay? Um, then accountability. Of course, it's really a big topic. Um, accountability is problematic um, with algorithms and especially when they are becoming autonomous with machine learning because you are using data from a lot of sources with pos potential intervention of human beings in the process. So at the end, you have the output, but you really can't understand what's the process in the middle. So how can someone, anyone, be accountable if you really un don't understand what's the process to arrive to uh, a decision? And this, is, this must be analyzed jointly with another factor, which is the trade-off between accuracy and transparency. This is a big problem. Uh, are there computer scientists here? Yeah, a couple. Uh, so you might 
you know for sure that there is the problem of the trade-off between accuracy and transparency. Uh, so to be accurate, you need a lot of data, no matter like how you're selecting them, because you want to have the big data, let's say. Uh, but if you act like this, then the process will be less transparent. So you have to decide if you want it transparent or if you want it accurate. And there are competing tendencies. Uh, and this leads us to the third problem, the black box. Are you familiar with the concept of black box? Okay. Um, generally speaking, when in this context we talk about, we refer to black boxes, we mean uh, the fact that we know the input data, we know the outcome, we don't know what's in the middle. Okay. So, for instance, you have a deep, yeah, a deep learning software analyzing 1,000 boobs to see if there is, uh, if they are gonna develop cancer, breast cancer or not. So you have the outcome, so you know that certain breasts are gonna develop cancer, but you don't know why. So as a woman, would you have your breast removed because you have the outcome or you want the explanation as well? And for the research, you need just the outcome or you need all the process. Um, up alongside the technical black box, which is what I just described, we have also the organizational black box and the legal black box. The organizational black box is related to the fact that these algorithms are used by organizations which are profit maximizing and uh, that are operating under minimal uh, transparency standards. So we don't know how really these organizations work. We don't know how Google works, for example or how Facebook works. Uh, and the legal black box, you can imagine, is related to intellectual property. So the abuse of intellectual property rights that are closing the boxes, so we, don't, we are not allowed to access, for instance, that Compass report that was used to sentence to six years Eric Loomis. Okay? So we have these problems, and I think that uh, we shouldn't be replaced by algorithms. Also because at the end of the day, yeah, human beings sometimes suck. Uh, but at the same time, there are good reasons to trust our fellow human beings more than how we trust machines. And here again are just the first things that came to my mind. So why do we behave? Why do we behave in a nice way, in a good way, uh, pursuing the common good of society? Because we are good. Social pressure. Social pressure. Mm -hmm. Sanctions. Yeah. Possibly we are not good. We are horrible people usually. <laughs> um, but we are afraid of sanctions. So we behave because we don't want to, we don't want to go to jail. Okay? Or we don't want to pay a fee. What about a machine? Can a machine go to jail? Can a machine be scared of a sanction? I don't think so, right? And that's a big problem, for instance, with robots. A robot can do a lot of stuff, but can't go to jail, so, or a driverless car, okay? Then there is the psychology of conformity. Uh, you might be familiar with Solomon Ash experiments in the 50s. Um, so he was saying the reason why we act in a certain way is simply because everybody is acting in that way. So we tend to conform to the majority, which in a democratic society should move towards the common good, in theory. Um, then there is my favorite thing, which is hypocrisy. I live in England, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I'm referring to a beautiful concept uh, by a guy who is, whose name is Elster. And he talked about the civilizing force of hypocrisy. Civilizing force of hypocrisy. Okay? So again, why? So we are, let's say we are a parliament. Okay? We, we are the parliament. And of course, everyone has their private interests. But why is not everyone actually openly, at least, uh, carrying out just the self-interest. 
because you are exposed to the judgments of the others, so you will pretend that you actually care about the common good, and you will take the, the, those decisions that will be more easy to defend publicly. And so you will act in a hypocrite way, because maybe you just care about your self-interest, uh, but the force of hypocrisy is civilizing, because if over time you systematically take the right decision out of a hypocrisy, at a certain point you will believe it. You will always behave good for a reason which was originally a hypocritical reason. Then there is a question, how do we learn? What does, what does it mean to learn for a human being? How did you learn? How are you learning? Like you studied know, books, case law, you discuss with one another, now we are learning. Um, so Dreyfus, a guy, uh, and, and others think that knowledge and learning are a holistic process that you can't really, um, let's say, apply to the way you train an algorithm. You, you take an algorithm and you train it using certain data. This is not the same thing that happened to your brain when you learn something, okay? It's a way more complicated process. Let's say that I'm wrong. Let's say that, well, actually, we can find, uh, for instance, the best lawyer in the world, and we create uh, like 1,000 clones. Um, are you watching Orphan Black? No? I love that. Uh, anyway, we create 1,000 clones, uh, and then we can kill all the rest of the lawyers in the world because we have 1,000 perfect lawyers, okay? Um, and then we have 1,000 machines. It, it's not a human being anymore, okay? Um, do you, can you see any problem in this? In this finding the best lawyer in the world and replicating the way this lawyer decides? Do you think this could be a solution? And why not? Hmm? No innovation? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, same errors over and over. And, and how, do you how do you decide who's the best lawyer? I mean, apart from myself, how, how, would, you, how would you choose it? And I don't want to be cloned. So. Um, so you see that there are problems. And for these reasons, I think that we shouldn't be replaced by algorithms. So what can we do about it? So again, as lawyers, we want to have answers. So not just all the questions that I, uh, I ask till now. If a client comes to you and says, an algorithm took a decision against me, what can I do? Okay? My answers come from a European perspective. So I would like to know if you have something similar here in Brazil or not. It would be interesting to actually discuss about this. Uh, the main tools are three. First one is uh, freedom of information requests. So I don't mean the human right to free speech and all that nonsense. Um, I'm talking about the practical tool when you are a citizen and you want to access a public document, you present a freedom of information request. Do you have something like this in Brazil? Yes? Yeah. Great. Uh, okay, so this regime has been used uh, two years ago in France to oblige the Ministry of Finances to let the citizens access uh, the algorithm that was used to calculate their taxes, okay? Because the, in France, they calculated taxes with an algorithm without telling the citizens how. Uh, and a, a judge, not a, well, the ministry was forced to let the citizens access. Uh, three months ago in Italy, uh, something similar happened. The Tarlazio, which is a judge, uh, forced uh, the Ministry of Education to let uh, teachers access the algorithm that decided where the teachers uh, were allocated in which school. Okay? Uh, so there is this possibility of using this, um, this regime. Of course, this is the scope of this regime is limited because it it applies only to 
public bodies, public documents, and, and stuff like that. Uh, then there is intellectual property. One point must be clear that intellectual property is more a problem than a solution. Okay? And this is in general. I teach intellectual property and I hate it. Um, so, um, but there are certain rules, especially exceptions to uh, the um, copyright on computer programs, uh, exceptions for observation, study, decompilation that could be used potentially to access uh, an algorithm. The problem is that there is the trade secrets regime that has potentially no limits. So you can use the trade secrets to cover everything you want. So even though in theory you might have a, um, a copyright exception to access the algorithm, then when there is the trade secrets in the middle, there is not much that you can do. And last but not least, welcome, uh, data protection. And this is the main thing, probably. Um, so are you familiar with uh, the general data protection regulation? Some of you, yeah. So it's the new law, European law on data protection. And it's going to become effective on the 25th of May next year. Okay, and this provision had this uh, law has a provision, uh, Article 21, which is dedicated to um, the right not to be subject to an algorithmic decision. The fact that you can't read this is on purpose, okay? Because I want to show how complicated is actually this uh, this regime. So in theory, you say. In theory, there is the right not to be subject to an algorithmic decision, okay? What does it mean? It se seems easy, right? Simply that you can't use an algorithm to decide and affect my life, okay? When you are processing my personal data. As easy as that. But then you read this and you say, what the fuck, what's, the, what's this? I don't know. Uh, because you have paragraph one with the main rule, paragraph two with three exceptions, Paragraph three with specific rules that apply to two of the three exceptions and paragraph four which is an exception to the exception <laughs> So if as a human I struggle in understanding what this means you can imagine how a machine can really try and Understand what's going on here um, So really if a machine yeah, if a machine tries to understand that that's the face of the machine um, <laughs> So we don't have the time to really analyze all, all that long provision, and I don't have the skills to do that. So I will limit myself to paragraph one, which is the main, uh, the main rule, okay? So let's read it together because it's, it's really important. The data subject shall have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing. Let's stop here. It's easier, right? The right not to be subject. What does it mean exactly? Does it mean that um, Google can't use algorithms to take decisions that affect my life? Or that Google has to inform me before taking decision, inform me of the right not to be subject to an algorithmic decision, and if I don't do anything, they can take the algorithmic decision that affect my life. So is it a general ban, a general prohibition, or it's just a right, so if the subject doesn't do anything about it, nothing happens. Um, this we had a similar provision under the previous regime, and this has been interpreted in, two different, in these two different ways in the different member states in Europe. So you can see, as an algorithm that has to interpret this, how would you decide? Uh, then it's a decision based solely on automated processing. Solely. Let's focus on that. What does it mean, solely? So what if, let's say a bank, let's say you want to buy a house, you go to a bank to get a loan, okay? Um, and the bank wants to decide if you deserve to get the loan or not, okay? Um, they will use an algorithm to decide if you are trustworthy, okay? 
and after the algorithm makes all the assessments and, and stuff, at the end of the process, you have the employee that clicks the button and sends you the email saying that your loan request was not accepted. In this case, is it as a, a decision based solely on automated processing or not? Mm? Who thinks it is? Yeah, yeah? who thinks it's, it's not? Someone. So it, it's not self-explanatory. And if we think that this is not an automated, this is not an algorithmic decision, this provision will not apply and your client will, will not have anything to do to protect himself or herself. Um, and then it's an algorithmic decision which produces legal effects or similarly significantly affects him or her. What does it mean similarly significantly affects him or her? We don't know, yep. Uh, in the previous regime, we had the same thing without similarly, okay? So significantly affect. So every decision that affects you in the past could, be, could fall within the scope of this provision, okay? Now it's only similarly. Similarly to what? To the legal effects, right? It, it would seem to me. So for instance, if you are uh, excluded for no reason, from all the social media in the world and you work with the social media, maybe it's not a similarly significant effect because you're only excluded by a social media. But we know that the exclusion from a social media can cause depression and in some cases even worse consequences. So who pays in a case like this? Um, so this was to just give you a taste of how complicated is interpreting this provision, which is the provision that our client would use to protect himself or herself against an algorithmic decision. And there is also the question of the meta algorithm. Are you familiar with meta? Um, so is it fair, is it right that an algorithm decides if an algorithm can decide about our life? That's the question. Yeah, I got confused. I hope you, you got the question because I don't. Um, so let's get to the conclusions. Okay, so here you can see my friend Donald. Uh, he's a chimpanzee. Uh, he lives with his wife, Melissa, Melania, Melania uh, in Tanzania. So um, why, how are we exactly different to Donald? I mean, he's stronger than me, and our brain biologically are not that different. So why we won and they lose? What's the reason for that? They are the closest to us, right? Um, alongside the bonobo, but let's, let's stick to Donald. The reason is a number of reasons. Until the 50s, the scientists would tell you the reason is that they can't make tools, okay? So they can't e evolve, develop, because they can't make tools. Then, of course, in the 50s, they discovered that they can make tools. So that must not be the difference. The difference is that uh, we are better at using tools, at making tools, and we are the only ones who can make tools that make tools, okay? So you will never find a chimpanzee that uh, makes a 3D printer, okay? A tool that makes tools. An artificial intelligence is a tool that makes tools to some extent. So the problem is that probably we have to focus, we, we, like our focus I think was on the wrong point. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because we have ask, asked ourselves what was an algorithm what was artificial intelligence, but we haven't maybe asked as much, what is a human being? What is that makes us different? What is that makes us human? And, and I think that future, future research should really look into this. What is the difference between us and algorithms, but starting from understanding what is that makes us human? Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Guido. Uh, before we go forward to the next uh, speaker, I should open the, the floor for a few questions if you want to clarify anything on a specific uh, presentation. So I'm going to have to get a way to, to make the list. So, <laughs> we have one, two questions there. So let's start with, please uh, tell me your name, tell us your name. And, uh, I'm not sure if I read this. Yeah. Um, so, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really nice, and I believe it was the first good presentation I've seen from the professor. They usually just read what they have to do. Thank you. So my question goes as the following. I'm a member of the Human Rights Clinic of Wet University. Mm -hmm. And not so long ago, we received a case in which a woman was a victim of a homophobic act in Facebook. She was exposed and humil humil humiliated by a third party, a very famous, famous actor, so to speak. Alexander Frota, you know him. So, um, <clears throat> and she came to us looking for legal aid. The thing is, after she was exposed by this actor, she received many, many reports on her Facebook account from the followers of this actor, and her account was, she was banned from Facebook, effectively. And after she was banned from Facebook and she lost contact with her friends and etc. And given the whole situation of humiliation she has passed before and the fact that she's a lesbian woman and she has many, many difficulties, including financial difficulties in her life, she started becoming depressive and suicidal. My question goes as the my question is the following. To which extent would Facebook be accountable for this act, because as we see it, Facebook deprived her of her right to the freedom of expression, her right to association, and the right to legal remedies, as she could not argue against Facebook in the decision of her banning, which goes against the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the American Convention on Human Rights. But to which point would Facebook be liable for a violation committed by an out automated algorithm. Well, can I answer to this or yeah. No, it's it's a of course it's a horrible thing. Um, I think in this case there is an intersection between the problem of algorithmic decision making um, and intermediary liability. Um, so um, I know that I think it's Article 19 or something of the Marco da Internet, the Internet Bill that you have here that regulates uh, the liability of the platforms. Uh, generally speaking, uh, unfortunately, the, the way the laws on intermediary liability are shaped are in the sense of granting nearly absolute, um, let's say, a di an absolute disclaimer from liability. So. It's very hard to prove that uh, a platform like Facebook is liable for something. Uh, but if you can prove that Facebook knew what was going on, uh, in that case, it's, you might have a good argument to say that actually that safe harbor uh, does not apply to, uh, to the situation. And, and I really hope you can, you can find this evidence because uh, cases like this are, are, are really terrible and they shouldn't happen and in theory Facebook uh, is committed to uh, protect freedom of expression and protect their users uh, so what I would do in the meantime while looking for evidence is to uh, kindly threaten Facebook to expose this sort of behavior publicly because in theory they would, should be concerned with their image so I would do probably this double strategy looking for evidence that Facebook knew what was going on and threaten Facebook kindly uh, to expose uh, the fact. I, I hope I answered the question. 
Well, I'll try to be very quick. I, I confess I, I appreciate very much the idea of computers development or computer development and algorithm development because I I don't trust human beings. I kind of <laughs> <laughs> I have this kind of problems and I I don't know if it is like this back in Italy or in the European Union, but our decisions, uh, our decision makers, the the courts and the the single judges, they they do have a lot of div divergences and they tend to be very very few. They tend, they tend not to be very reliable too. The, this problem that you quoted about not uh, about accountability of a machine, I see that view very very clearly in uh, a human being, and I I think that most of the problems that you that you quoted in the first in the both the first two uh, problems about algorithms uh, replacing us, they are mostly technical issues that may be or maybe or not of course. Um, and disappeared in the, in the new in the near future. I saw a lecture of, uh, from Richard Susskind that he he kind of separates uh, the the advances of telecommunications in three different big uh, big 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 problems that was kind of solved in the decades. And the last decade was uh, uh, search machines as Google and stuff like that. This decade was more about big data and in the next dec decade he's, he predicts there is a, uh, automa AI, AI 2.0 thing. So I do believe that these technical issues can be solved, at least partly solved, in this next decade. And I don't know if we could really rely on these issues to to exclude the, this possibility, not of course, not from completely replacing persons on the legal field but for computers, but at least partially. For example, um, I don't know, a, a professor of mine, he told me that um, Desembargador, I don't know how that called, a judge in, in Espírito Santo, he already used algorithms to solve cases quite simple cases yeah, involving transit accidents without victims and stuff like that, uh, small applications of algorithms could already be quite influenced in, in, the, in the judiciary field. So I don't think that we should be so pessimist, of course, not, um, not also so optimist. optimist like I am right now. <laughs> okay, um, well, I think no, I, I understand what you what you say here. Um, I think there is. Um, well, first of all, I can't, unlike some colleagues of mine, I can't foresee the future. I don't know what the next big thing uh, will be. I'm analyzing what the facts are now and what the law is now. Um, and the facts as they are now say that at the moment we can't replace, and I think we shouldn't. There are different, you know, levels of discussion. Uh, it may be that in the future they, they may be able to replace us and at that point only the second question will be there should they replace us maybe in certain fields they should you may seem to suggest other fields they should not I don't know I, I'm seeing what's going on now I'm, I'm trying to answer that question and if you didn't find my arguments convincing which is the case uh, there is also another one when you um, sort of draw a comparison between a traditional, a traditional statute, a traditional law passed by the, the parliament and an algorithmic law. There is a fundamental difference there. You may not trust your politicians, and I know that most of you do not trust them, possibly for a reason. I didn't trust Berlusconi either. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, it, of course, there is a problem there. But is it better that the, a law, which is the algorithmic law, is decided by a small group of computer scientists, which I, we don't know anything about them, we don't know anything about how they decide, and they will never be uh, accountable, even less than the politicians that you don't trust. So I think there is a problem there of democracy, I think. 
but of course, I, I do see your point on certain scenarios where algorithms could be used to improve our, the quality of our life. And that's why I prefer to focus on AE rather than AI, artificial enhancement rather than AI, artificial intelligence, or how we can use algorithms to improve our lives rather than replace us. Okay, let's have one last question in this batch of questions. And again, after uh, Professor Marco's uh, speech, we're going to have another opportunity for questions. Uh, Eugenio, please get a recording. Professor, when we discuss labor law, a great issue that we face today in the so-called gig economy and in what we call on-demand economy is how to deal with some uh, services like Uber and Lyft, which claim to have an algorithm, algorithmic management, which uh, means that they don't. They they say they don't have any uh, any kind of participation in managing the drivers. And how can we deal? With that question, with this issue, how can we propose to govern the algorithms? How can we, we uh, how can we regulate this work scenario? And another question: dealing with G, this GDPR, how can the, the those services like Uber and Lyft how how can they be accountable? And how does it the, the information they deal, the, 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 the data they deal, how, does, uh, how is that affected by this GDPR? Okay. Um, so, well, I, to be honest, I don't know anything about employment law. Uh, so, um, I, and I don't know anything about employment law in Brazil. Uh, I d for what I know, uh, employment law, even though it's considered part of private law, is to some extent public law in the sense that there are a, a number of public interests that are at stake when uh, there is an employment, uh, an employment issue. Which means that um, if you qualify the relation between um, Uber and the driver as an employment relationship, the judge should be able to actually force Uber to uh, disclose the details of the salary of, uh, of the um, driver. The point is that it's problematic to qualify the relationship in terms of employment. I don't know, how is, do you have any decision about this, about here in Brazil? Are they employees or no? And that's, that's why it's, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and so there is a, a problem there, and so I don't know, I don't think that we can use the tools that I explain here in that, in that scenario, but I suspect that uh, a judge would be available, would be able to order a disclosure there for public interest. I don't know how the law is in Brazil. In, many, in other countries you could do that if it's an employment relationship. If it's not, it's unfortunately more uh, complicated. And again, the GDPR, applies only if uh, there are personal data involved. So you have to assess if, if there is processing of personal data in, uh, in, that, in that algorithm. And I think from the outset, it wouldn't seem that uh, they are personal data because they are processing uh, what? The algorithm is processing how many requests of, of uh, cars there are and how many cars are available and, and try to fix uh, a price for that, right? a fee, right? My question in that sense would be about the rating, like they have the five-star rating. Ah, the rating, not, okay, so, so not the price of the, not the fare, the rating. Uh, I don't think, with the rating, I don't think there are personal data involved because I can't imagine a personal data involved there. So, um, again, if, if a rating is defamatory or if it's damaging the image of a person to up to a certain extent, you can use other laws. I don't think you can use data protection in that, uh, in that context. You have to assess if there is a moral damage <coughs> to the person or not and use general liability and mm, rules to, uh, to see if they fit in, in that situation. I wouldn't try to use uh, 
the GDPR or data protection in that context. But I might be wrong. I should have to study actually how the algorithm works there. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so uh, let's move on to our next uh, guest. Please, Professor Marco, take the seat. So Marco is going to give us uh, insights probably more on the philosophy side. So, and at the end, I hope we can both have uh, debate and questions about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Professor. well, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really sorry for, be, for being so late. Uh, and I, I thank the organizers for the invitation. And it's really a pleasure and an honor to share the table with Professor Guido. You are welcome uh, here. Uh, well, I will project the text uh, because I think it could help to follow my, my presentation. Okay. Well, uh, I would like to start with a little warning. The proposed title of this table was Who Governs the Algorithms? Transparency and Prejudice in the inter Information Society. I do not intend to get away from these issues, my government, algorithms, and transparency. But I would like to face them starting from a different question. Uh, more than who governs algorithms, my question is how to govern with or through algorithms. In, all, in other words, I would like to understand how we are governed by algorithms. And in putting this question, my attention turns to the strategy of power employed following a clear Foucauldian approach. OK, I would like to start my speech by highlighting my recent research trajectory. My intention is to present the path that uh, brought me to the question of the government by of the algorithms. I hope in this way to cl clarify the kind of research that I have accomplished and what and that I intend to continue the developing in the coming the coming years. Okay. Well, uh, four years ago, I defended a doctoral thesis in the graduate program in philosophy of the Federal University of Minas Gerais, this university, on the emergence of the modern notion of authorship and the birth of copyright. It was a work strongly inspired by Michel Foucault's genealogical research. After the thesis, I began a new investigation as a postdoctoral researcher on more current issues related to the digital world and the internet. The title of, uh, of this research, which I developed in the last four years, was Internet, Cyberculture, uh, New Technologies of Power and Subject Positions for a Diagnosis of the Present Time. Present time. In general terms, the research analyzes the current transformations that conform what is known as cyber culture, highlighting cognitive impacts, new power technologies, and emerging subject positions. Several questions have been addressed. Yeah? What are the cognitive, political, and ethical repercussions of this process? That is, how our thinking and our cognitive abilities are changed by the new practice of the digital world? What kind of power regime is set up by this new order and how does it work? And what are the emerging subject positions? Well, the questions above point to three central domains in our philosophical tradition, the cognitive, the political, and the ethical. In short, the interest lies in the way we think, in the way that power works, and in the new forms of constitution of the contemporary self. The first two years of the research were devoted to cognitive issue, that is, to the way we think, the changes in intellectual technologies and their impact in our, on our cognitive abilities and also to the question of contemporary subjectivity, that is, the new practices of constitution of the self. Over the past two years, 
uh, the focus of the investigation was directed to the question of power in the digital age, with emphasis <coughs> on new social movements, surveillance, practice, and resistance strategies. Okay, this semester, I'm taking a new step in my career as professor here né, of theory and philosophy of law. I intend to continue my research with even more emphasis on the problem of power as well as the challenges that the information society presents to the field of law. Well, I hope to keep here at the law school the study group that I coordinate at the Faculty <coughs> of Philosophy and Human Sciences since 2014. The group called SEGA, or Study Group on Information Society and Algorithmic Government, will have its first meeting next week. Eh? And all are invited to attend. It's an ad advertising here, <laughs> OK? Uh, the study is of this semester will be dedicated to the Belgian law philosopher Antoinette Rouvois, who, was, uh, who has several works on the subject of algorithmic governmentality. She is currently a researcher of the FNRS, Le Fonds pour la Recherche Scientifique, or Fonds uh, for Scientific Research, attached to the Centre de Recherche en Formation, Droit et Société uh, at the University of Namur uh, in Belgium. Okay, this afternoon I would like to talk about this notion of algorithmic governmentality developed by Antoinette Rouvois, who is strongly influenced by Michel Foucault's work, uh, taking into consideration that this research is still taking its first steps. My intention here is just to bring some questions and suggest some provisional thesis. Okay? Well, I would like to address uh, the following issues. First, what does governmentality mean? And second, what is an algorithm and what way does an algorithm govern? And the third, uh, what does it mean to be governed by algorithms? What challenges does it bring to the law and for human freedom? And what kind of resistance is still possible against algorithmic governmentality? Okay. Well, let's start with the first point. Uh, what does governmentality mean? Well, Foucault introduced the notion of governmentality during his lectures at the Collège de France in the late 70s. In the lecture of uh, on January 10, uh, 1979, Foucault explains that he was inter uh, interested in learning the art of government or the way an individual's conduct is shaped and controlled. In these lectures, Foucault defined and explored a fresh domain of research into what he called governmental rationality or in his own neologism governmentality. The Foucault's 1978 lectures on Collège de France uh, pilot uh, security, territory, and population uh, start with the analysis on the how of power. In this context, uh, bio, power, or apparatus of security are studied, in addition to the studies made on the power of sovereignty and the disciplinary power. Uh, Biopower referred to a set of procedures or relations that manipulate the biological feature of the human species into uh, a strategy for gov governing an entire population. Population, in this sense, refers not simply to people, but to phenomena and variables, such as birth rate, mortality rate, and marriage statistics, and thus encom encompasses the whole field of the social. Okay, the fundamental object of governmental security dispositives is precisely the population. The population is a set of elements in which we can note constants and regularities 
and with regard to which we can identify a number of modifiable variables on which it depends. Security te technologies are, in, the, in this sense, an attempt to govern <coughs> circulation process at the population level in an economical and rational way. Security dispositives aim at what not yet has happened. As a result, security strategies operate as a management of open series that can only be controlled by an estimate of probabilities. It is this new strategy of power that will be analyzed in the light of the notion of government. Okay, government, according to Foucault, was a term discussed not only in political tracts, but also in philosophical, religious, medical, and pedagogical texts. texts. In addition to the management by the state or the administration, government also signified, pro, uh, signified, uh, signif signified uh, problems of self-control, guidance of the family or for children, management of the household, directing the soul, etc. The French verb gouverner covers a range of different of meanings. If can it can have a material and physical meaning of to direct or move forward, or to provide support for. It can have a moral meaning or uh, of to conduct someone in a spiritual sense, or tangentially to impose a regime on a patient, or to be in a relationship of command and control. <coughs> According to Foucault in, in his 1982, he say, the subject and power, uh, I quote, uh, government does not refer only to political structures or uh, to the management of states. Rather, it de designates the way in which the conduct of individuals or groups might be directed. The government of children, of souls, of communities, of the sick. It does not only cover the legitimately constituted forms of political or economic subge subjection, but also modes of action more or less considered or calculated, which are designated to act upon the possibilities of action of other people. To govern, in this sense, is to structure the possible field of action of others." Right? End of quotation. Okay, a focus on conduct, on conduct perhaps leads to the most concise definition of governmentality as the conduct of conducts, or the regulation uh, conduct of behaviors. Uh, governmentality operates to produce a govern governmentable subject. In short, government refers to conduct, or an activity meant to shape, guide, or affect the conduct of people and forge the very constitution of the subject. In his 1982 essay, Subject, the subject and power. Foucault also states that power is only power rather than mere physical force or violence when addressed to individuals who are free to act in one way or another. Power is defined as actions, actions on other, others' actions. That is, it presupposes rather than eliminates, eliminates their capacity as agents. It acts upon and through an open set of practical possibilities. Quote, quote in Foucault, in itself, the exercise of power is not violence. It is a total structure of actions brought to bear upon possible actions. It incites, it induces, it seduces, it makes easier or more difficult. In the extreme, it constrains or forbids absolutely. It is nevertheless always a way of acting upon an action, an acting subject, or acting subjects by virtue of their acting or being capable of actions. A set of actions upon other actions. Okay, in short, government relies on freedom 
Quoting Foucault again, when one defines the exercise of power as a mode of action upon the actions of others, when one characteri characterizes these actions by the government by men, of men by other men, in the broadest sense of the term, one includes an important element, freedom. Power is exercised only over free <coughs> subjects and only insofar as they are free. By this, we mean individual or collective subjects who are faced with a field of possibilities in which several ways of behaving, several reactions and diverse comportments may be realized. Okay, power as strategic games is an omnipresent feature of human interaction insofar as it signifies structuring the possible field of action of others. Government refers to more or less systematized, regulated, and reflected modes of power, a technology that go beyond the spontaneous exercise of power over others, following a specific form of reasoning, a rationality, which defines the telos of action or the adequate means to achieve it. Government, then, is the regulation of conduct by the more or less rational application of the appropriate technical means. Foucault uses the term rationality of government almost interchangeable uh, with art of government. He was interested in government as an activity or practice and in arts of government as ways of knowing what that activity consisted in and how it might be carried on. A rationality of government will thus mean a way or system of thinking about the nature of the practice of government. Who can govern, what governing is, what or who is governed. With the notion of governmentality, Foucault moves from the what to the how of governance. Finally, one last question, why the need for this ugly word, né, governmentality? Né? Why not simply call this new government or even governance? The, world, the, the word né, governmentality refers to both the process of governing and a mentality of government, thinking about how the governing happens. It is thus both an art, a practice, and a rationality, a way of thinking about government. The semantic linking of governing, gouverner, and modes of thought, mentalité, indicates that it is not possible to study the technologies of power without an analysis of the political <coughs> rationality underpinning them. As a way of thinking, governmentality represents an important methodological tool, not theory, that provides a flexible and open-ended lens through which the minor tactics of governing are magnified. So a whole field that can be described a governmentality studies can now be identified. Antoinette Rouvois' studies on algorithmic governmentality can be perfectly situated in this domain. Governmentality studies have shown, have shown how numbers, indicators, and all the means of quantification lie at the very heart of the art of governing people. OK, let's go to the second part, second question. What is an algorithm? In what way does an algorithm govern? OK, what actually is an algorithm? For most computer scientists and programmers, an algorithm at its most basic level is the set of instructions used to solve a well-defined problem. Generally, they differentiate between the algorithm, the set of instructions, and the, its implementation in a particular source language. Algorithms usually express the computational solution in terms of logical conditions, uh, knowledge about the problem, and structures of control, st strategies for solving the problem. 
leading to the following definition, algorithms equal logic plus control. This may seem harmless, but nowadays a large part of our daily lives have become inhabited by algorithms or code operating mostly implicitly and in the background. Algorithmic action has become a significant form of action or actor in contemporary societies. Okay, to figure it out, just keep in mind some services provided, for example, by Google, Facebook, Uber, Waze, or Netflix. The recent rise of algorithms in the social science has brought about an, impression, an impressive range of work. Algorithms are said to be powerful and also dangerous. Sociologists, computer scientists, political scientists, legal scholars, anthropologists, designers, philosophers, users, activists, policymakers, and many more are talking about algorithms. In, the most, in most cases, the current e events are causing some <coughs> fear, and we are increasingly concerned that individual autonomy is lost in an impen impenetrable set of algorithms seen as powerful entities that rule, sort, go govern, shape, or otherwise control our lives. Algorithms, algorithms concern us because they seem to operate under the surface of the back or in the background. That is, they are inscrutable. We cannot directly inspect them or in many cases under understand them as source code. They become black boxes, even to their designers sometimes. Thus, decisions become encoded and encapsulated in complex, inscrutable algorithms. These algorithmic systems can also operate automatically in the background with the need, with, without the need of human intervention. If algorithms are inscrutable and thus can operate automatically and in the background, then they are most certainly actors with which we should be, co be concerned. As such, there is a strong sense that they need to be governed more explicitly. If one accepts the argument that algorithms are important actors in contemporary society, then the question of governance of their actions or of these actors naturally emerges it is becoming clear that algorithms govern us in some way, or a kind of governance guided by learning machines and computing systems that are able to automatically capture and process data uh, from multiple sources using statistical calculations. Across state and private institutions, a vast array of algorithmic actors are becoming more or less interconnected to operate as technologies of calculation and regulation deployed to enact and regulate their subjects. Be it citizens, migrants, tourists, suspects, customers, students, friends, and many more besides. Okay, Antoinette uh, Rouvois uses the term algorithmic governmentality, or Gouvernementalité algorithmique, clearly based on Michel Foucault to refer very broadly to a certain type of a normative or a political rationality founded on the automated collection, aggregation, and analysis of big data as so as to model, anticipate, and preemptively affect possible behaviors. We can better understand algorithmic governmentality by, talking, by taking into account its three stages of operation, data valence, data mining, and profiling. Okay, the first stage consists <coughs> of the collection and automated storage of unfiltered mass data, what can be called data valence, constitutive to, the, to big data. It is estimated that the digital universe today is made up of more than 100 and, uh, 
1,200 billion billion bytes, 19% of which would appear to have been produced in the last two years. This number, which doubles every two years, will need to be multiplied tenfold by the year 2020, reaching a total of 44 zettabytes, or 44 trillion of gigabytes. The data are available in massive quantities from, di uh, from different sources, in a variety of formats, text, image, sounds, geolocal location, mobility data, etc. We leave all the time digital footprints, which are often collected by the full by mechanisms of to monitor online movements, eh? CCTV, GPS, tracking, traffic flow, etc., etc. An increasing proportion of digital data comes from what is now referred as to as the Internet of Things, the networking of smart devices able to communicate with each other and therefore themselves to produce huge amounts of data. These networked devices emit information on the movements, activities, performance, energy consumption, lifestyles, etc. of their users. Today, when we work, consume, or travel, we, we inevitably produce data. Governments collect them for the purpose of security control, research, management, etc. Private companies collect large quantities of data for marketing and advertising purposes to customize offers in short, to improve their sales uh, efficient efficiency and therefore their profits, etc. Individuals themselves willingly share their data on social networks, blogs, mailing lists, etc. All this data are collected and stored in data warehouses as much as possible by the full, devoid of any prediction about specific and uses of this collection. In other words, the purposes that the data will serve once correlated with other data. The optimal function of this mode of statistical, statistical intelligibility presupposes the non-selective collection of as much data as possible, a priori independent of any specific fin finality. The exponential increase uh, in big data is a result of the retention by default not only of directly useful data, but also of the data which are merely of potential utility. The usefulness of each data it's eaten uh, depends on the quantity of the other data with which it may be correlated. In the big data universe, it is therefore perhaps not going too far to think that by means of a network effect, the potential value of each piece of data increases depending on the quantity of data collected. The second stage is that of data <coughs> mining as such. In other words, the automated processing of this big data to identify subtle correlations between them. It's, it, it seems crucial to note here that it is therefore a matter of knowledge production. Statistical knowledge comprised of simple correlations based on information that is unsorted and therefore perfectly heterogeneous. This knowledge production is automated, which means that it requires minimum, minimal human intervention and is uninformed by any pre-existing hypothesis, unlike traditional statistics. Indifferent to, uh, to the causes of phenomena, it functions on a purely statistical observation of correlations between data captured in, the, in an absolutely non-selective manner in a variety of heterogeneous contexts. The purpose of what is called machine learning is ultimately to directly enable the production of hypotheses based on the data themselves. Norms seems, uh, seem to emerge directly from reality itself. These norms 
or this knowledge are, however, only made up of correlations. And the third stage consists in using this probabilistic statistical knowledge to anticipate individual behaviors and associate them with profiles, profiles defined on the basis of correlations discovered through that data mining. In order, in order to properly understand what constitutes the algorithmic profiling, it is important to understand the crucial difference that exists between information at individual level, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the knowledge produced through the profiling. Most of the time, this knowledge is not available to individuals, and they cannot perceive it but it is nevertheless applied to them in such a way as to infer knowledge or probabilistic predictions uh, regarding their preferences, intentions, and propensities, which would otherwise not be ev <coughs> evident. The aim is therefore to prompt individuals to act without forming or formulating any explicit reason and even without any clear desire. In short, the goal is to conduct the conduct of individuals, or as Foucault says, to govern. Algorithmic governance thus seems to signal the culmination of a dispersal of the traditional conditions of subjectification uh, and individuation. These are being replaced by objective operational regulation of possible behaviors based on raw data that carry no meaning on their own and whose statistical processing is primarily designed to accelerate flows, avoiding any form of the two or subjective reflexive suspension between stimuli and their reflex responses. Moreover, the field of action of the power is not situated in the present, but in the future, as well as the security dispositives analyzed by Michel Foucault, the algorithmic govern mentality is essentially related to what could become, to propensities rather than actions taken. To talk of government by data is to imid uh, immediately evoke a change in approach in the detection, classification, and predictive assessment of events in the world and of the behavior and propensities of its inhabitants. That is to say, therefore, a new way of making the world predictable or a new way of exercising power, a new govern mentality. And the last question of my uh, presentation. So, what does it mean to govern, to be governed by algorithms? Now, what challenges does it bring <coughs> to, the, to the law and for human freedom? And what kind of resistance is still possible against algorithmic govern mentality? I would like to conclude my presentation with some brief remarks on certain political, ethical, social, and legal repercussions of the phenomenon of algorithmic govern mentality previously outlined it. Today, digital di uh, data plays an increasingly predominant role in informing and guiding action in virtually all sectors of business and government. We face an ab abundance of data since individuals are considered to as temporary aggregates of exploitable data at an industrial scale. It is on the basis of these data, rather than on the basis of institutional or deliberative processes, that the categories by means of which individuals are classified, evaluated, rewarded, or punished are drawn up. These same categories are used to evaluate the merits and needs of individuals of the uh, or the opportunities or dangers underlying the lives they need. In this view of government by data, 
how can we ensure the survival of individuals as subject, subjects of law? How can we ensure that individuals are not viewed only as temporary digital data exploitable on an industrial scale, but as subjects of law in their own right? I believe that having an understanding of the rationality of the algorithmic process, data mining, machine learning, etc., is a, is a necessary precondition for any normative <coughs> reflection on big data in terms of the rule of law and fundamental rights and freedoms. The new capacities based on data intelligence, much of which remains imperceptible or inaccessible, inaccessible to the ordinary citizen, can significantly magnify the asymmetry of information and power between those who hold those data and those who voluntarily or not emit them. Although the digi digitization of the world does not meet with any significant reluctance from individuals, this is because it seems to be the inevitable, indissociable and necessary cost of a multitude of new services new functionalities of digital services, the ability to engage in social interaction via digital processes. We look generally at the most immediate effects and it is not clear what may be the long-term consequence, consequences in our lives. We could argue that there is a close complicity between algorithmic governmentality and advanced capitalism. The digital raw data are today the very texture of capitalism. <coughs> this explosion of data is a hyper-indexation of absolutely everything, including the personal form. Something seems quite worrying here, the fact that individuals themselves come to conceive themselves as only hyper-quantified, call it the contemporary quantified self we bypass subjectivity by automation. Here also we avoid subjectivity, since we no longer appeal to the human capacity of understanding and will to govern. It is no longer a matter of threatening or inciting, but simply by sending to people signals that provoke stimuli and therefore reflexes. It is not only that there are no longer any subjectivity, but it is that the very notion of subject is itself being completely e eliminated or radically transformed thanks to this collection of infra-individual data. Yet algorithmic governmentality is not without producing particular subjectivities. Fragmented, the subject comes in the form of a myriad of data that link him or her to a <coughs> multitude of profiles as a consumer, a potential fraudster, a more or less trustable or productive employee, and so on. All of them are related to him or her without inscribing him or her in any collective context, and the individual becomes in the, in the infinitely calculable comparable, indexable, and interchangeable. A profile is not, in reality, about any one person. No one fits it exactly, and no profile pertains to a single identified or identifiable individual. Algorithmic governmentality focuses on, uh, not on individuals, on subject, but on relations. It circumvents and avoids reflexive human subjects feeding on infra-individual data, which are meaningless on their own. To build supra-individual models of behaviors or profiles without ever involving the individual, being profiled in this or that way, however, affects the opportunities <coughs> and that are available to us and consequently the realm of possibilities that defines us.
not only what we have already done or are doing, but also what we could have done or could do in the future. One might think that all this is science fiction, perhaps. Not at all. Uh, if we are to believe Eric Schmidt, Google's CEO, technology will soon become so effective that it will be become very difficult for people to see or consume something that has not in some sense been tailored for them. In the marketing field, ultimately, the aim is not so much to adapt supply to individuals' impulsive or spontaneous desires, but rather to adapt a person's wishes to what is on offer by adapting sales strategies. The time when advertising is sent out, the way the product is presented, setting, the price, etc. In this way, we are perhaps moving from an intentional, an intention-based economy to an instinct-driven driven economy. Individuals are most often described as consumers or users with promises of improving their experience and much more rarely as citizens. Algorithmic governmentality <coughs> devalues politics. It does away with institutions, with public debate, presenting the issues in terms of innovation, competitiveness of the individual interests of consumers or users, often hides the ethical, legal, and political issues of the digital revolution at the risk of undermining the rule of law, human rights, and fundamental freedoms. Insofar as data intelligence reviving a sort of digital behaviorism would gradually supplant the political and legal forms through which we represent what is real. We need to ask how the law will still be able to contain, limit, and restrict the dominance of algorithmic governmentality. It is understandable the problem for legislators to protect, to erect barriers around the individual, but these barriers emphasize precisely why, what is at stake. We can give rights to individuals on their personal data, and this is necessary. But all these rights are not properly applicable to the algorithmic scenario. Big data is interested in categorizing of a quantity of persons by without being concerned about this person individually. We bypass the subjectivity and we th thus arrive at a kind of machinic objectivity. The legal systems for protecting individuals with regard to automatic processing of data must therefore, first of all, ensure that individuals, subjects of law, have a presence, an impact, a consistency in a universe in which only temporary <coughs> data exploitable on an industrial scale count. Secondly, they must prevent people being locked into profiles they know nothing about and with, with, with they are unable to challenge. Given consistency to subjects of law means always taking into account individuals' capacity for not doing or wanting everything which they are statistically predisposed to do or want and to always assert their right to themselves account for their own motiv motivations. Subjects are shown no respect if we do not at the same time respect their capacity for reticence, uh, for reservation, for not doing what <coughs> the algorithms predict and, uh, and their ability to say for themselves what prompts them to act. It, it's only by reframing the concept of subjects of law 
that, is po that it is possible to imagine how appli applications based on data intelligen intelligence could be developed in harmony with political beings, what we are, that we are. Furthermore, this digital revolution calls for a constant vigilance and a continually renewed examination of the relevance and the appropriateness of the legal instruments for protecting our fundamental rights and freedoms. What, are, uh, what all this suggests is that an intensive replacement of human observation, evaluation, and prediction by autonomic process might well deprive us, in part at least, of our abilities to make normative judgments and more fundamentally even to set new norms. The question is thus the following. When individuals are subjected to the gaze of multimodal observation dispositives functioning on autonomic computing and when forward-looking statistical evaluation and classification becomes the privileged vector of governmentality, aren't individuals deprived of occasions and on the long run of their cap capability to form and implement moral judgments and normative reflex reflexivity? Do these new uses of statistics that are data mining and profiling not reduce us to impotence faced with the imminent norms spawned by algorithmic governmentality? Does the regime of digital behaviorism not threaten today to undermine the very underpinnings of emancipation by eliminating notions of critic and of project? The same danger of the politicization and demoralization is carried by technological paternalism and ramping in any technology designed for the purpose of enforcing a certain regularity of behaviors or of rendering practically impossible behaviors, attitudes or actions that were previously simply forbidden by morality or law. These preemptive dispositives, uh, in so far as they succeed in their regulative and normative tasks, simply bypass conscious acceptation or contestation of the norms they enforce. Then, to finally conclude, one final remark. Politics is nothing more nor less than uh, that which arises with resistance to governmentality. The possibility, the potentiality or of dissent, contestation, insurre in insurrection dem demarcates power from violence, force, or domination. Power that which allows some to drive the conduct of others, the conduct of conduct, always presupposes the possibility for the individuals and groups uh, targeted of counter-conducts. Counter-conduct refers to Foucault's more preferable term signifying resistance. This remains a fascinating area of study. By interrogating the how of government, we might perform the art of not being governed quite so much. Okay, thank you so much for the patience. Thank you, Professor Marco, for the presentation. Uh, we have some time now for questions and debate. Would anyone like to raise a question, make a comment? Uh, okay. Please, uh, we have to, we'd like to record it. Okay. Uh, professor, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's not clear to me yet whether this algorithmic govern govern 
mentality is uh, a step of the government uh, described by Foucault, or it's su something uh, substantially new. Uh, it's maybe it's just an, an optimized version of uh, which Foucault described, or maybe we should consider uh, reconsider everything we know about govern and govern mentality. Okay, I think, uh, of course, there are something new, uh, absolutely new in the phenomenon of uh, algorithmic governmentality. But it, I don't think we, can, we have to discard or we have to, to leave uh, the Foucault's analysis because I think uh, Foucault presents a kind of big, uh, um, a big image uh, or uh, 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 he, gi he gave to us a lot of tools that we can use in our investigations in our uh, to in, in, in a way of to, to understand what has happened today but of course it's not the same it's not exactly the same of uh, what has happened today is not exactly the same that Foucault uh, spoke in the 70s of course uh, but the idea of the uh, a, a strategy of power based in the idea uh, in the practice of government uh, in the kind of conduct of conductions uh, in the way of to uh, to to, con to conduct individuals in some way uh, without uh, uh, ex without any uh, how can I say any norm or any question or any desire uh, explicitly formulated is a kind of behaviorist conduction uh, this uh, and a kind of uh, management of the future uh, this I think is uh, employable to our uh, situation today but it's only we have of course some difference and uh, we have a lot of texts that points to the difference we a lot of texts that points to the oh, okay we can use this idea today but of course we have to adapt yeah <coughs> a comment and, uh, and a question uh, a comment was when you said that uh, no profile fits an individual so all these profiles that are created um, to target to target us uh, that made me think of uh, research I was carrying out about uh, targeted advertising so for instance how Facebook sells as advertisements right uh, and and so I found a way to actually sort of <coughs> access the profile that Facebook had on me so the way Facebook was actually targeting me uh, and I found out that Facebook thought that I was a lesbian woman <laughs> and so I was targeted as a lesbian woman um, that was the comment um, yeah the question was so since uh, since power presupposes freedom and agency um, so would you say that um, the shift from uh, the government of the politicians to the government of Facebook and of the algorithms it can be described uh, entirely already now as a shift from power to violence? Um, uh, uh, some way, yes, because it's a kind of violence. Uh, this, when we conduct the others without uh, exactly, uh, without any reason, without any um, uh, interpolation of, uh, how can I say, the desires or the consciousness of, the, of people, uh, it's a kind of, of violence because we, we, it's not a debate. It's, it's not an argument. It, it's, only, uh, it's only a kind of uh, conduct of, of others. Nah, it's a behaviorism. Nah, it's a, I think it's a kind of violence. Okay, so I guess we're done for final remarks. I'd like to uh, thank everyone who stayed until the end. I'd like to invite everyone who's interested to participate both in Marco's uh, study group as well as the uh, Jeanette, the Internet Law study group. The meetings will be on Fridays at uh, 11 and 30 on room uh, 1201 here at uh, 1202. One. One. Meetings are open. Uh, invite anyone to participate, either in just one meeting or the entire semester. We try to make many 
uh, projects to um, engage everyone. I'd like to make any comments on, on your study group, Professor? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a start next uh, Wednesday. Uh, it's uh, where? I don't remember. It's a classroom 902, not since the days, I know. 902, I think. Well, uh, okay. Uh, and everybody uh, is welcome in the group, okay? So, do you have any <coughs> final remarks? No, no, no. I just really want to thank you for this opportunity and thank you particularly for organizing this. I imagine that wasn't easy and I really feel home here, so thank you. So, and everyone is invited to have a beer with us. The best part. We're probably going to either Malieta or um, something that is. And better is paying for everyone. So. <laughs>